Hello and welcome to the Great Roast Revival video series produced by The Morning Advertiser and powered by Nor Professional. I'm The Morning Advertiser's managing editor Nicholas Robinson and over this three-part video series we're going to be exploring the role and future role of the humble pub Sunday Roast. For all we have then just once a week the Sunday Roast is the sixth most popular meal for consumers to eat out of home. And when we are eating a Sunday roast out of home, we're choosing to do so in a pub more than in any other type of dining venue, MCAHIM Insight shows. Looking at the future of the roast, analysts believe the dish has a bright one, with their ability to adapt being a key strength. And that's the sort of stuff we'll be looking at over the coming weeks, starting with the basics of the Sunday roast in this episode. Then we'll be moving on to the look of the dish when it's served, speaking with experts and also chefs who will show us three ways to serve a roast. In our final episode, we'll be doing a bit of future gazing, speaking to food analysts and also award-winning chefs who will all give us their view on what the future of the Sunday Roast holds. Now, you wouldn't have a Sunday Roast without the four main elements, the meat or the meat alternative, vegetables, Yorkshire puddings and of course the gravy or liquid gold as many chefs refer to it. We can all go and grab any one of these things and plonk it on a plate, but how do you know if you're choosing the right ingredients? In this episode, we ask the experts what we should all be looking for to make the best dish possible. From the meat to the veg and the gravy, we look at how to source each and prepare each element, giving inspiration and ideas to help you move your roast to the next level. Let's start with the meat. Earlier, I spoke to a butcher who knows their rib from their rump. Time to talk about the star of many roasts, and that is, of course, the meat on the plate. To help us understand what a great piece of meat on a roast dinner looks like, I'm joined by Russell Allen, Managing Director of Aubrey Allen, Butchers to the Royal Household. Russell, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, first of all, could you tell us what sort of cuts we should stay clear of when we're thinking of a roast dinner? I would say avoid bad meat, and I know that sounds an obvious thing to say, but, you know, this kind of race to the bottom that we have with Sunday lunch where people are offering it cheaper and cheaper and perhaps co compromising on the quality. So I'd say always buy the best quality meat you can at the level of restaurant or pub that you are. So I understand that you've got four cuts that we're going to show on screen as mm -hmm. well. Um, just talk us through through those and why we should be looking at them for roast dinners. Shoulders of lamb are become increasingly popular because they're fantastic. There's loads of fat content. Chefs enjoy to uh, slow cook them, flake them down, use them for those sort of more modern dishes. Often now, legs of lamb, which you know years ago were almost double the price of shoulders, if not more, fantastic value. And that for me is a great cut for Sunday lunch. The other one that is really out of favor at the moment is topside. You know, people often go, oh, I can't put topside of beef on. They perceive it as being a cheaper cut, but cooked in the more modern ways, where chefs got access to water baths and rationales can be fantastic. The other one is pork collar or pork ribeye, as we like to call it, which again, belly pork has uh, reached, you know, unprecedented real value over the over the last few years. When years ago we used to throw it in the sausage, and the pork collar has lovely fat the same way. Doesn't have any crackling, but you know your butcher should be able to sell you some extra skin. And I've got some single muscle rump joints, which again we take the heart out the middle of the rump, and these are great for places that perhaps don't have great big volume and want some small joints to pop in the oven as they go through service to ensure that they have great freshness. You mentioned a moment ago um, that we should avoid bad meat, um, but what if we need to reduce the cost of a, a plate, a, a dish? Um, what sort of cuts could we be looking at in that sense while also maintaining quality? Well, if I go back to top side of beef, to my mind, you better have top side of beef of a fantastic animal, you know, grass fed, beast that's been, uh, you know, has a decent age on it. So it's over 20 months, not these very young animals that are entering the food chain now and matured properly by your butcher. To me, having a piece of that is far, far better than having a strip loin or sirloin of beef from an inferior product. There's still this awful practice in our industry where people buy what they call roasting sirloins, whatever that means. Well, I can tell you what it means. It normally means sirloin or strip loin imported from all kinds of different countries from around the world that sat in a vacuum pack bag for a very long period of time. I think you're better to give a cheaper cut of a better animal than an expensive cut of a poor one. And what should chefs be asking for from their butchers? Because what you talked about there sounds like 
butchers could really help chefs out? The way we work with a lot of chefs is in, in collaboration or, you know, we work together on menu planning. The best thing to do, I think, when you're writing a menu is the way that you'd shop maybe if you're on holiday, you know, certainly the way I shop, is I go to the market and I see what's good and then I decide what to cook around those products. I think uh, if you're writing your menu in isolation from your product, you're probably going to put on a product that's maybe fashionable at the moment, which is fine, it's great, but you are going to pay extra for it. Whereas if you talk to your supplier, be they your butcher or your fishmonger, you might find something isn't quite as popular, but there's a bit of a, a bit of an excess of that your butcher can offer you a better price. If I give you an example, in the springtime, lamb chumps and lamb racks are fetching a premium. Talk to us as a chef, we can offer you something like saddles of lamb are often cheaper at that time of year. You can do a cannon probably at less money than a rack. And the way that we seen butcher the legs now, we can produce you uh, a lamb parve at a fraction of the price of the lamb chump. So your customers are getting fantastic spring lamb, but you're paying less of money for it and still delighting your guests. So do these conversations happen enough between chefs and butchers? What could we be missing out on if we're, if we're not utilising the, the knowledge and experience of a butcher? I think they're missing out on finding out about different products. I think we're all creatures of habit at the end of the day. If you're a, in whatever business you're in, if you're a chef, you're going to look at things that are tried and tested and worked for you previously. Or it might be somewhere where you're a younger chef where you've learned to put that cut on. I think you're missing out on finding new products, finding new innovative ways of saving costs, and finding something that's going to give you a point of difference to your competitors down the street. Russell Allen, MD of Aubrey Allen Butchers, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And now let's head over to the Unilever kitchen to see how the chefs get on with some of what we've talked about with Russell today. Thanks Aubrey Allen for the demonstration on the meat. I'm Steve Groves, head chef of Rural Parliament Square, and I'm going to show you how we prepare it and then cook this lovely sirloin of beef. What I'm going to do is just trim some of this exterior. Where it's been beautifully aged, it's got loads of flavour. I just want to trim away a little bit of the edge and that's going to be a really good kind of flavour enhancement for my gravy later on. So I'll just trim away a little bit of this chain, which is a little bit sinewy. Dice up this trimming so we can roast it later for flavour. Just, just trim away this edge piece here as well. And with the fat, I'm just going to score into that fat so that it renders down nicely when we roast the meat. You can smell where that meat's been aged. That it's just got that beautiful beef flavour. Just going to season that with salt and pepper quite generously. Just press it in so it sticks. And we're going to pop that onto a, a wire rack on a tray so that the meat is elevated from the tray, so we don't want the surface temperature of the tray to overcook the meat on one side. So just keeping that lifted means that the, the hot air in the oven can get all around the meat, cook it nice and evenly. With this one, we've got this lovely rump cap of beef. It's from the top of the rump, so it actually benefits from the, the aging process um, in terms of the flavor. It's quite a thin cut of meat, really good flavor, and cooked properly, really nice and tender. And it's got a lovely covering of uh, this really tasty fat as well. To prepare it, it's not a great deal to do, just the, the outermost piece of meat that's been most exposed during the aging process. I'm just gonna trim that away. Can keep that to use later. Don't want to waste anything. Just trim up the fat a little bit, but Really, I don't want to do too much more other than just score the fat to help that render down and release some of that fat over the meat as it cooks. Just score in a crisscross fashion, about a centimetre squares. I'll season it with salt and pepper. Generous with the salt and that really enhances the flavour. And that's ready to be slowly roasted before I finish it in a frying pan. So here we've got this lovely rack of pork. When we buy the pork, we wanna make sure we've got a nice fat covering on there. This has been really nicely French trimmed by the butcher. Also what I've done with this is just dried this out, uncovered in the fridge for two days. So we've scored it, rubbed a little bit of salt on there, and just dried that out in the fridge for two days. That just allows the skin to dry out, which is gonna give us that perfect crackling, which with roast pork is, is what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned. Just gonna make sure these score lines are, are deep enough so that that skin can just puff up when it comes to roasting it later. 
and I didn't season the meat before the, the two day drying process in the fridge just because I don't want to cure the meat. It's just to help draw some of the excess moisture out of that, of that skin. Now's the time to season the meat, plenty of salt. I'm not going to put any pepper on the skin. I'm just going to put pepper on the underside because I don't want it to burn when it comes to the high temperature roasting that I'm going to do on the, the skin later to puff it. So that's ready to go into a low oven and that will further dry the skin out and just enable us to puff it for beautiful crackling. Here I've got a lovely Gressingham duck. We can see the skin's quite wet, so we want to sort that out because on a duck we want lovely crispy skin. We want to get some of this fat rendering down. So. In terms of preparation, I'm just going to remove part of the wing. We'll keep those for stock sauces. And I'll remove the, the Parsons nose. And then what I've got here is a, a big pan of, of boiling salted water. So that's going to help season the duck. It's also just going to blanch the skin. So it's going to start tightening up the skin the salt in there will start to draw out some of the moisture and then we're going to age it. So I'm going to blanch this six times in the boiling salted water. So 10 seconds at a time. I'm just going to pop the duck into the water. 10 seconds and then take that out and just refresh that in ice water. And this is just to stop the meat from cooking because at the moment all I want to do is start to cook the skin and start to make the skin tenderized. You can already see that it's starting to firm up slightly. So another 10 seconds into the ice water again. And the reason we're going in and out of the water is just to cook the skin without cooking the meat at all. One last one. And then we need to make sure this is fully chilled down. So there's plenty of ice in there. And then we're going to pop that onto a tray and I'm going to leave that in the fridge for two days for that skin to dry out and that will make it so that we can get a lovely glassy crispy duck skin. Now let's not forget the element of the roast that makes up the majority of the plate. Vegetables. Where would we be without roast potatoes, broccoli or even cauliflower peas? What do the vegetables we put on the plate say about our dishes? To help us understand this a little more, we're joined by Ian Nottage, Head of Food Development at Fresh Direct. Ian, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Pleasure. What, what are the benefits of using seasonal veg? The veg is uh, fresher because there's normally a shorter time from field to plate. Quite often it's tasted because it's picked at its optimum time. The other thing, it gives your menu variety and interest demonstrates you've got an understanding of seasonality as well. Uh, so it's a great way to educate the younger members of the brigade about what seasonality is and why it's important, because I think in some instances that's actually been lost. What do we miss by not observing the seasons when it comes to food? It's very easy, I guess, that we sort of just default to batter on carrots and frozen peas for 12 months of the year. Um, so I think, you know, it's about the freshness and it's about the variety on a plate and it reflects your understanding of the seasons um, to your customer. Now, chefs are quite price conscious, you know, making sure that the GP of a dish is, is as good as can be. How does seasonality affect price? It's a little bit of a common misconception that produce in season in the UK is always going to be cheaper than import. Uh, a really good example of that is English asparagus. Um, even in the middle of English asparagus season, uh, it will still be three, two to three times the price of an import from, say, Mexico or Peru. But that's really down to... Um, you know, the sort of cost of labour abroad and also sort of the, the space they've got to grow it and uh, land's a lot cheaper. So it's not always necessarily cheaper, um, but it is, again, it gives you that sort of, uh, the opportunity to upsell the fact that you're featuring UK seasonal produce on the menu. What about the environmental impact of vegetables? How can we work better to limit the, the environmental impact of what we put on our plates? You know, it's better to use UK purple spray and broccoli, carrots and beetroots, uh, when they're in season as opposed to an imported equivalent. The reality with fresh produce, um, we don't air freight a lot. A lot of it is travelled by uh, roads uh, and rail and sea. So it's not so much about air miles, but even that has an impact. So yeah, absolutely, from, the, from an environmental point of view, 
it does make um, sense as, as we've used in sustainable fish to use in season product. It's always good to speak to the green growers about what's in season as well to get their view on what is UK and in season at time. Now we tend to stick to a core range of vegetables on a Sunday roast. You mentioned it earlier, so your carrots, your frozen peas. Um, what, what do you think that we're missing on a Sunday roast? What sort of vegetables could we be looking at? And I think it's important as well that we always look at the variety, but it's also how we cook things. You know, there are, of course, you know, so many different sort of ingredients out there, like sprouting broccoli as opposed to regular large head broccoli. We can use things like Napa cabbage or Chinese leaf which historically is used in stir fries and things. But again, if it gets the barbecue treatment or the grill treatment, especially with a little bit of herb butter, chili, garlic, that sort of thing, it can add a real dimension. Obviously, the great British roast isn't complete without a roast potato. Um, but then you can use sweet potatoes too. A little tip is that they won't crisp up as much as a roast potato will because they're not the same family. They don't have the same high starch levels. Uh, but you can add a little bit of polenta or a little bit of cornstarch to that before you roast them and that will help them crisp up as well. Red cabbage is another one, it's another brassica. We tend to use them predominantly sort of on Christmas menus, cook with a little bit of vinegar and sugar and so on, which is lovely. But again, we can maybe think about doing it slightly differently. Um, red cabbage could ferment it, possibly. Uh, you can pickle it. A roast dinner doesn't just have to be boiled steamed veg you know it can be a lot of variety and a lot of value to the plate and a lot of texture and color other um, ingredients you can use things like parsley root you know it's hard to come by but those are a phenomenal roasted uh, or they respond really really well to sous vide treatment if you're lucky enough to have a sous vide machine backpacker etc um, it really locks in all the nutrition and the flavor of vegetables particularly root veg things like baby carrots a little pinch of butter and seasoning you can even use things like what we think typically of salad crops. So things like um, Little Gem, again, is amazing, pan fried, roasted, uh, adds a bit of freshness, particularly if you've got uh, like a sort of roast throughout the summer months, it adds a bit of lightness rather than very heavy. You're only really limited by your imagination, but it's really a case of trying to step out of the uh, just bat on carrots and peas, really. A lot of the vegetables that you just mentioned are on Noor's Future 50 list, which is a, a list of sustainable vegetables. What is a sustainable clue. vegetable and how does it benefit a chef? The clue's in the title because you, if it's sustainable, you know as a chef that product you're cooking today will be there tomorrow and in years to come. So it's in everyone's interest that we, you know, we grow sustainably. If you ever get the opportunity to go out and meet some of the UK growers, they are probably some of the most sustainably minded people you'll ever come across. It's in their interest to look after the soil, look after the land. Uh, and agronomy is really, really important that you're not, you know, exhausting the soil because the soil is at the heart of everything that we we put on our plate effectively, whether it be, you know, meat or vegetables. It's about looking after that as well. Equally, from a chef's point of view, um, if you can state your sustainable credentials on the menu, you know, if it's, you're lucky enough to have a grower just down the road from you, you can feature that on your, on your menu, on your Sunday roast then that's great. And I think that actually drives footfall for the customer as well. It makes good commercial sense as well as environmental sense. Ian, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Now let's head off to the kitchen to see how two chefs handle future 50 foods as vegetable side dishes. Hi, I'm head chef Jordan Neil Thompson and today we're going to be making tender stem broccoli with roasted chicken skin and honey dressing. Tender stem broccoli is one of Noor's future 50 foods which is eco-friendly and better for the environment. So let's get to it. Right, so to start with, tender stem broccoli, we need to take the tails off, like so. That gets rid of all the dry dead ends. Put them to one side. And because the stems cook at a different rate as the heads, we're gonna take those off and cook them separately. We're gonna go into a pan of hot boiling salted water with the stems first. Take the chicken skin from the chicken carcass, lay it out flat, heavy seasoning of salt over the top, like so. Okay, so now we've flat baked our chicken skin between two oven trays uh, for around about 15 to 20 minutes. Heavy on the seasoning, salt, because you want that real crisp-like skin, translucent. And now we're gonna break it up into shards and make a crumb for seasoning the top of our broccoli. Okay, so what I've done is I've taken the excess skin from the chicken and the fat. We're gonna render it off in the pan. Once it's given its natural fats out, we have the tender stem. 
and then fry the tender stem in all the natural fats. Once the fat's rendered and crisp, you can see the color on the broccoli. Nice little drizzle of honey, just to finish it off, add some sweetness, cut through the fat. I'm Chef Jordan Mill Thompson, and this is my tender stem broccoli, roasted chicken skin, and honey. Thanks Jordan for that tender stem broccoli dish, looks great. I'm gonna do a, a braised red cabbage dish, and then I'm gonna do some crushed parsley root. So I'm gonna start with the, the red cabbage. This is one of my favorites, especially kind of in the cooler months. I think we're gonna cook it with some spices, which I think work really nicely. And also in there, I think it's important to have a, a good bit of acidity. So a little bit of vinegar gonna go into that. I'm gonna start with some shallot, which just gives a lovely depth of flavor to it. So I'm just gonna take that and slice it nice and thin. So I'm gonna pop my shallot into some butter and just start that cooking down. Season that with a little bit of salt. You get a little bit of color on the shallot, not too much. Relatively gently. Just give that a minute or two and then I'm gonna add my red cabbage. So my red cabbage I've just sliced nice and thin. I'm just gonna pop that in. And just turn that over in the butter as well just start the cooking process before we add our liquids. And to that, I want to add some apple. So the apple, I'm going to use a Granny Smith's apple, which I think is a really nice balance of sweetness and acidity. And it also doesn't break down to a complete mush. And I'm just going to grate that in. So we get these fine strands of apple. And then to that, I'm going to add a little piece of cinnamon stick, which I think gives it that lovely kind of winter spice feel. Some demerara sugar, soft brown sugar would be fine as well. Just adds a nice bit of sweetness. To counter that sweetness, I'm gonna add some sherry vinegar, or you could use red wine vinegar. Good plug of that. I'm also gonna add a little bit of port, which again gives a little bit of sweetness and some red wine. And we just want that to braise. And I like to cook it quite slowly, but I don't like to cook it for too long so that it all just turns to mush. I like to keep a little bit of structure to the cabbage. So I'll cook it for about 40 minutes or so, just until it's nice and tender. A lot of that liquid will evaporate. With the sugar, it will become slightly syrupy, which I think just makes a really lovely accompaniment to lots of roast meats. So I'm gonna let that cook down for 40 minutes. This is my braised red cabbage. It's one of my favorites. I'm now gonna work on the parsley root dish. Parsley root is um, it's a vegetable, obviously it grows at the bottom of the, the parsley plant. As a vegetable, it's very similar to a parsnip. So it's got that kind of lovely sweet root vegetable flavor, um, slightly perfumed. I'll start by peeling these. Okay, I'm just gonna top and tail them and then cut them into relatively thin slices, just so they cook quickly. Once I get about halfway up, I'm just gonna split them so you get relatively even pieces. So I'm gonna melt down a good amount of butter, cook the parsley root in that until it's lovely and soft, and then I'm gonna season it with some salt and pepper, and at the end I'll finish it with my herbs. I've got some chervil and some parsley, which will just give it a nice freshness at the end. Okay, I'm gonna crush the parsley root. You could blend it into a puree at this point, but I want to leave some texture in there. And then we'll finish it with the herbs. Nice and generous with those. Serve that. Finish it with some picked chervil as well. And the delicate flavor of chervil works really nicely with the parsley root. That's my crushed parsley root with chervil and chives and Alex is going to show us how to make fantastic gravy and then we'll pull the whole dish together. 
Thanks, Steve. My name's Alex. I'm the exec chef for Unilever Food Solutions, um, and I'm just going to make the gravy to go with this roast beef. So I'm going to start with the trimmings that Steve had left over. I'm going to brown those in the pan. Then I'm going to add in some shallots and some carrots, deglaze with a bit of red wine, add in some water, and then whisk in the no gluten-free gravy granules. Add in a little bit of oil so we can start the cooking process with the beef. So these are all the trimmings and all the wastage that we would have got off the beef when Steve trimmed it up. You saw him take off the chain, take off some of the fat. So this is all of those bits and pieces, just leftovers. So what we want to do is start developing those flavors in the base of the pan. And we want to get the color in there because the color and the flavor and those reactions are going to bring out that caramel flavor. So it's starting to brown now. So I'm going to add in the shallots and some carrots as well. Okay, and it's starting to get a little bit dry, so we're okay with just add a little bit more oil. Now this is utilizing up the wastage from the beef, but what we can do is we can just use a veg base as the gravy that we've got, the gravy granules are actually suitable for vegetarians, suitable for vegans. So we don't have to worry about creating lots of different gravies if we don't want to. We are gonna do it for this one because we wanna utilize up that wastage, but if you are busy in your, in your pub, in your restaurant, you can get away with just having one gravy for all. So I'll get this cooking down for another five minutes and then uh, we'll add in the red wine to the glaze. All right, now that's cooked down, I'm just gonna add in a little bit of time just to amplify the flavors and give it a little bit more depth. Once that's in, I'm gonna add the red wine. And again, I'm gonna reduce that right down so it's practically gone. But this is to remove all of the good stuff from the bottom of the pan. So I'm just gonna add in the water. You can use stock. Right, now it's come back up to the boil. I'm just gonna add in the uh, gravy granules. Whisk that in. Just allow it to simmer for a couple of minutes. As you can see, the sauce is thickened up. They're gluten-free, so it's thickened up without adding an allergen in there. I'll just pass it now into a fresh pan to remove all of the beef trimmings, onions and thyme, and then you're ready to go. Well, there's your gravy. Now it's over to Steve, who's gonna finish plating up the dish. And then we're going to finish that with Alex's lovely gravy. Fill up the Yorkshire. So this is the final roast dinner. We've got a lovely rump cap of beef, which we've cooked slowly in the oven and then finished by searing it in a pan to get that beautiful roast flavor. Lovely crunchy roast potatoes. Obviously you can't have roast beef without a Yorkshire pudding. The parsley root, just cooked in some butter, finished it with chervil and chives. Sprouting broccoli, finished with a dressing of mustard and shallots and braised red cabbage. I hope that gave you some inspiration in how to make your pub's roast dinner a little more exciting, but also to think about the sorts of cuts you're using, as well as the vegetables you put on the plate. In our next episode, we'll be looking at the presentation, thinking about how the roast looks on the plate and what we can do to make sure its visual impact is just as good as the taste. Thanks for watching, see you next time.